Yes. In plants, the responsibility of transport is carried out by xylem, who transports water and mineral salts, and phloem, who transports sucrose and amino acids. So let's first deal with the water uptake. Of course, Acha, tell me one thing. As far as the uptake of water is concerned, would you call it unidirectional or bidirectional? Uh, miss, I classify it as bidirectional. Water uptake. Water. Sorry, water, uh, water would be... You, you sorry, unidirectional, I believe. Of course, unidirectional, right? Because this is yeah. what I told you. The main difference with last time, this is what we were discussing last, last time, that the main difference between the function of the xylem and the phloem is that, remember these arrows which I had shown? The red arrows, uh, sorry. Yes, the black arrows are actually showing you the movement of water. So you can see that the water movement is only taking place in one direction, which is from below upwards. Whereas as soon as the sucrose and amino acids are made in the leaves, they can travel in both directions. They can travel upwards also, and they can travel downwards also. Is that clear to you? Yes, miss, that's fine. Yeah, so let's go back. And uh, where were we? Yes, so it says that uh, the water uptake is only in one direction. And of course, the water uptake begins from the soil through the root hairs. Do you remember the structure of the root hair that I've done with you already? How does a root hair, uh, do you remember the various features and the structure? Yes, Hamza? Yes, I do, miss. To some extent, yes. Mm -hmm. So um, the root hair has a cell membrane, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, it contains no uh, sorry, it contains no, uh, what do you call, chloroplast or chlorophyll. It contains a nucleus. It obviously is a cell membrane. Uh, it has a long and narrow process that has a large surface area to volume ratio for higher diffusion of the mineral ions along with the water. Uh, it has mitochondria for energy, uh, for active transport, right? Uh, it also has, obviously, cytoplasm is present. Does it have ribosomes? Uh, yes, it has ribosomes. Yeah, ribosomes. So is that the general feature, the structure? Mm, exactly. Now, here in this paragraph, they are talking a bit more, of, they're talking about the root hairs also. But at the same time, they are talking about the tip of the root. And they're saying that at the very tip of the root, there is a protective cap that's known as a root cap, which is meant to protect the root as it grows through the soil so that it's not damaged, right? Besides the root cap, the rest of the root is covered by a layer of cells called the epidermis. And the root hair cells are formed from some of the cells in the epidermis, right? Achha, let's look at the diagram to see it more clearly. This is basically an electron micrograph, okay? Uh, like a very high power magnification of a tip of a root. So the tip of the root is showing you that uh, it is not covered by root hairs. Okay? If we go a little bit behind the root cap, we'll see that the epidermis is there. And from the epidermis, the root hairs are emerging, right? So this is like, I would say this is a, a magnified root hair, which is 70 times and it can be seen through the electron microscope. Now, if you look at this picture, I think this is a better picture. This is taken through a light microscope, okay? And it shows you the root hairs, how, do, how, do, how does it show you? This part. In fact, I'll just color this part in black. This one. These are the epidermal cells that we were talking about in the textbook of yours. All of them cannot be seen uh, very clearly because some cells are broken. Okay. Achha. And you can see that from some of the epidermal cells, you can see those extensions. And wherever you see that extension, we say that that's a root hair. Is this clear? Yes, miss. I understand that. Right? So this means that somewhere over here, if we extend the root to this part, lies the root cap. The purpose of the root cap is just to protect the deeper structures. The root, the root cap doesn't have root hairs, but the epidermal cells, they have root hairs. All these are the epidermal cells. Right? Some of the epidermal cells have these extensions of the cell membrane and they are known as the root hairs. And the very purpose of so many root hairs is that they are tiny, they are small, they can actually dig deep down into the soil 
to capture as much water and mineral salts as possible right acha when i was doing the root hair with you when we were doing movement into and out of the cells did we talk about active transport occurring through root hairs uh, no no you just gave me the general idea that root hair uh, optimize uh, what do you call active transport Achha. we didn't go into detail i didn't go into the details okay let's look at the details over here this is even a like a more detailed diagram of how water moves from the soil to the xylem vessels in a root now now see <coughs> um this is the root this entire thing is the root whatever you can see just from here till here is the root sorry this is the extension which is the root hair so i would say that you know if i include this like this this is the root right acha in this diagram the movement of water is shown to you so of course we can see that the root hair is digging deep down into the depth of the soil these brown colored particles are the soil right acha now what do we do we water the soil we put water over here isn't it so do you expect the water potential to be high over here i hope you know the meaning of water potential yes hamza yeah water potential is something like the concentration of water in a certain area exactly so do you uh, expect it to be high in the soil yes yes i do correct okay so this diagram is showing you this blue arrow is showing you that the water is moving from the region which has a higher water potential which is the soil to a region which has a lower water potential which is the root hair cell so it's going it's going 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 and then of course it reaches here what structure of the root hair cell is this which i am coloring right now this one uh is that the epidermis that's the vacuole oh vacuole right okay it's the vacuole okay so now i am now zooming into it more now the this water it has reached from the soil to the root hair and now from the root hair cytoplasm or vacuole whatever it will move from this root hair to the cortex of the root cortex is a region in the root and <clears throat> the way by means of which it passes from the soil into the root hair and from the root hair cell into the neighboring adjacent cortical cell is osmosis and of course since it's osmosis so this means that water is moving across the partially permeable membrane so this part of the root hair cell or the root is the epidermis this is the root hair and these are the cortical cells and you can see see everywhere for example if i start the journey of water from over here if i start numbering the journey of water i say this is step number 1 so at this step the water potential is more over here so hence the water moves down the gradient moving 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 now what happens finally at this step now this is step number 2 the water potential will be high in this cell as compared to this so the water will move from here to here take right. yes Let, i get that you get that let's move to step 3 now when the water reaches here the water potential will be high in this cell so what happens is that they simply just keep uh, the water keeps transferring through the vacuole and the cytoplasm right exactly exactly so same spread. and so more water keeps coming through over and over and over again and then water is simply transported and finally finally you, you can just look at the journey of water it's still not complete finally it will keep yeah. on moving till it reaches the xylem vessel do you see now this is the xylem let me just encircle it with red pen Do you see any individual cells inside xylem? No, miss, I do not. Nucleus. I just see hollow sections. Empty hollow space. Yeah. So does it show that it's a dead vessel? Yes, it does. Okay, fine. So this is how the water is transported. Now, what you do is just read the descriptions, the different descriptions which are given over here, which are this one, this one, and this one. Read it. Yes, 
you want me to read it miss don't read it yourself yeah the force i repeat the question what is the strongest force that is responsible for pulling up the water against the gravity in a plant so that strongest force is not the root it's actually the transpiration pull okay note okay, this down full name is transpiration pull i can't just say transpiration ha huh. transpiration pull uh, just a minute i'm going to write it over here and you can copy this down so um we have this so the answer will be when you're done then let me know all right from this diagram this can, meeting is being recorded you can get any kind of a question in fact i would say that this is the most frequently given diagram as far as this chapter is concerned so if you are given such a diagram you can be asked a question from the chapter diffusion osmosis you can be asked a question from this chapter also so you can say a lot about it <clears throat> let's say it, it all depends upon what the question is for example the question can be solely on explaining how osmosis is taking place so you're going to talk about water partially permeable membrane and the water potential gradient and you're talking you're going to talk about that this process occurs passively from cell to cell because every time the water is moving into another cell the previous cell uh the water potential of the previous cell is more than the water potential of the upcoming cell right so it goes like that yes a question on active transport can also come an active transport basically takes place of the soil uh, like of, of the mineral salts from the soil what happens is that let's say this is your root hair cell right this one is your root hair cell so the cell sap do you know what the cell sap is hamza sorry miss i didn't catch the last part what is the cell sap do you know uh yeah i do I, what is I it have, like 
So a cell sap is simply a, a type of vesicle. Uh, it's not a vesicle. It isn't? No. Sorry, a vacuole is a vesicle. Cell uh, sap is the liquid found in the vacuole. All right, yeah. Okay. And the cell sap, if I just zoom into this, this is a root hair cell, right? The cell sap of the root hair cell, which is this, is by default, by default, it is a concentrated solution of mineral salts or mineral ions. But the plant always needs more and more mineral ions for its growth. So for that reason, the mineral ions need to be transported from the soil to the cell sap. Now, since the mineral ions are more concentrated over here as compared to here, which means they are in a lower concentration in the soil and they are in a higher concentration in the cell sap of the vacuole. So when they need to move, they need to move against the gradient or up the gradient. And for that reason, these mineral ions can only be transported if there is ATP from aerobic cellular respiration generated in the mitochondria of the root hair cell. Is that understandable? Yes. I think I've, you know, I've had a discussion on this with you, which is why, you know, this question is asked in exams. Why do root hair cells have a lot of mitochondria? So what will be your answer? Uh, for the purposes of active transport, miss? Of? Uh, of the mineral ions along with the water into the root hair cell. Why? Why does uh, it need energy? So because the concentration of the mineral salts? Well, yeah, the, the concentration of the mineral ions is greater inside of uh, the root hair cell than outside. Okay. In fact, now you say the concentration of the mineral ions is more in the cell sap of the root hair cell. Mention the word cell sap because cell sap is by default a concentrated solution of mineral salts. Right? Okay. Achy. Yeah. The same thing is being described here. Just read from here to here. This thing. Quickly read this. Less at the top. This meeting is being recorded. This is because there's less amount of water at the top. Is. No. No, sorry. There's more amount of water present at the top. No, no. Look. See. This is a plant. This is the base of the xylem. This is the top of the xylem. Your textbook is saying that over here, the pressure is less. And over here, at the base of the, the xylem, the pressure is more. And because of the differences in the pressure, the water, the water is sucked up. Okay. Who is creating yeah. a less pressure at the top? I told you when I was sharing that uh, page from the A-level book. What is that force? Transpiration pull. Transpiration pull. But how was that force initially generated? What was happening inside the leaves? What was happening? Through the stomata, like the water was uh, going outwards. Exactly. Exactly. That's the main reason. That's the main reason. That is why, that is why what's your textbook saying? Just a minute. Your textbook is saying, in the next topic, we will see what causes the reduction in the pressure at the top of the xylem vessel. So what causes the reduction? Transpiration. Transpiration. Right? Transpiration. Okay. So what will you say if I ask you this question? What are the functions of root hairs? How will you describe it? Explain how this. So the first one, what are the functions of root hair cells? Let's uh, say, if I say, wait a minute, if I say um, it has three functions, okay? Or a root hair cell, huh. um, number one is to diffuse or, uh, or absorb mineral ions along with water. Okay. Uh, number two is um, transport the water from the root hair cell to the xylem vessel. Correct. And the last function of a root hair cell is, so transport the water, that's done. Um, store, 
store sucrose or something? No, 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 no. Root hairs are too tiny to store anything. Root hair cells, their function is that they increase the surface area. To, oh, right. Ah, yeah. Right? That's why. To increase the speed of the transport. Okay. Explain how the structure of the root hair cell helps it to carry out its function. Achha, for, for answering this question, just list down, list down five features, five features which you think that the root hair cell has, which can facilitate it in performing the function. Five features. Yes. Number one. Number one is that the process is long and narrow. Correct. Which helps in uh, diffusion or absorption. Mm -hmm. uh, number two is that um, it contains a large vacuole which contains a lot of cell sap, which has mineral ions that helps in the active transport of mineral ions through the process. Correct. Third. Uh, number third is, can I, can I label the structures? Sorry, no, we can't label the structure, no. Huh. Uh, maybe that the cell, the cell wall is um, fully permeable, allowing water to pass through it from one cell to another. Correct. And? Uh, number four is that, so we're done with the process, the cell wall, uh, um, mineral ions are transported, diffusion. Lots of mitochondria. Yeah, lots of mitochondria present for transferring, uh, transporting mineral ions for active transport. And one more structure left. And one more, oh, is, is, it, is it really like, uh, is it perhaps related to the cell membrane? Exactly. It has a partially permeable cell membrane. Yeah, partially permeable cell membrane. Mm. But how, how does that help? It so does it like block, block out all the bacteria and substances? No, 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 no. no. Actually, it's the partially permeable cell membrane through which the osmosis is taking place. Oh, yeah, right. Okay. I forgot. Okay. Yeah. Got it? Because always yes. remember, always remember that osmosis is a living process. Diffusion can happen in living things and non-living things. When I say, when I use the word osmosis, uh, it means it's, it pertains to something living. Okay? So if something is living, then it means it requires cell membrane. Because cell membrane is a living structure, right? Yeah. Okay. Use your knowledge of osmosis to explain how water moves from the soil into a root hair. So using your knowledge of Osmosis to explain how water moves from the soil into a root hair right up to the cortex and then from there into the xylem. Now you explain it to me by looking at this diagram. Yes. Okay, so the first step is that the water potential outside of the root hair is higher than the water potential inside, right? So hence osmosis obviously takes place through the process of the root hair cell. Uh, osmosis is the process by which um, water, uh, the net movement of water particles from a region of high water potential to a lower water potential through the partially permeable membrane. So the partially permeable membrane in this case is the cell membrane. So water diffuses in. Second step is that uh, it transfers into the root hair cell, right? And from the root hair cell, it transfers from one root hair cell to another root hair cell. And this is because of the cytoplasm and the cell wall along with the cell membrane. So all of them just pass on the water from one root hair cell to another. So this, keep, this keeps on happening because the water potential in the root hair cell to the right is obviously lower than on the left, right? So water keeps going uh, through one another, sorry, through the root hair cells through osmosis until it reaches, uh, uh, what's this called, Miss? I forgot. The fourth step. Achha, wait, wait, wait. Were you thinking that these are root hair cells? Uh, these ones, yes. So you were wrong, actually. Root hair cells, they finish after this boundary. Okay. okay? And you can see right. it very clearly over here because root hair cells only emerge from the epidermis. And this is the boundary line of the epidermis. After this boundary line, what, does, what is there? It's cortex. So you're going to call these cells as the cells of the cortex, or you can call them cortical cells. So don't call them root hair cells. So right? cortical cells. Yeah, cortical cells or cells of the cortex, whatever you want to say. Okay, so the water then diffuses, sorry, um, uh, 
diffuses through osmosis through the cortical cells from one cortical cell to another um, up until it arrives. Miss, what's this yellow layer called? I forgot. Is it the epidermis? Endodermis. Endodermis. So this mm -hmm. is like the uh, upper it's, epidermis or something. No, 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 no. It's not the upper epidermis. It's this one. We did this when I was doing root with you. Remember last time? Do you remember? This is the layer. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. Yes, now so I do. Basically, now look here. Now try to imagine the root hairs over here. The root hairs are lying over here, right? Epidermal extensions, basically. So what you are explaining, you are explaining what is moving from the root hair. All this is cortex, and then endodermis, and after endodermis, xylem. Is this clear? Yes. Right. Acha. Okay. So. Yes. And what else? Uh, so then it pass, it diffuses. So it's, it's mostly diffusion that's occurring. So diffusion occurs again and over and over again up until it arrives at the endodermis cells. And then osmosis still occurs where the water just keeps passing through it until it flows into the xylem vessel. And then through the transpiration pill, uh, so pull, uh, water is transported from the region of higher pressure to the region of lower pressure, which is the top part of the plant. And yeah. Okay, good. Very good. Let's see the last. I shall use your understanding of water potential to explain how water moves from the soil and across the root cortex. So we did it already. And now we move on to the concept of transpiration. I have already explained you a bit of transpiration and I want you to go through these three pages. I am giving you around 10 minutes. Okay. And uh, you read till this page, uh, till this page where you can see the diagram and you have the soft copy of this textbook. Yes, Hamza? Sorry, miss? Do you have the soft copy of this textbook? Yes, I do. Okay. So what take it do out. is that... This meeting is being recorded. Okay, so... Uh... Is it okay if I just read line by line and then just summarize it into my own words? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Okay, so the first line goes like, um, the spongy mesophyll tissue in a plant leaf is very important in helping to keep water moving through the plant. Uh, there's not really uh, much I can simplify. It just says the spongy mesophyll tissue. So there's like two layers of uh, mesophyll cells in the plant. Uh, the, the plant cell, number one, one of them is the spongy mesophyll and the other one is parasite mesophyll. So in this one, it basically says that the spongy mesophyll is really important in helping keep, uh, water move throughout the plant or through the plant, meaning um, I'll go out of the plant. It then goes on to say that uh, the combined surface area of all the spongy mesophyll cells is very large and this and this surface is in contact with the air space, um, air spaces in the leaf. So this basically means uh, that the uh, the surface area or the outer surface of the spongy mesophyll cells is in contact with the intercellular spaces that are found within each plant cell. Uh, and then it says liquid water moves into the mesophyll cells from the xylem vessel by osmosis. A lot of water then evaporates from the cell walls, ending up as water vapor in the inter um, interconnecting air spaces. This means that, uh, so there, there's like two bundles, right? So one of them is the xylem and the other one is phloem. Xylem is responsible for carrying mineral ions along with water. So uh, xylem carries water and it transports it to, or it transfers it to the um, spongy mesophyll cells. And from the spongy mesophyll cells, the water tends to come out on its surface and obviously evaporation occurs, which turns the, those small water droplets into water vapor which are then found in the intercellular spaces or interconnecting air spaces. And then it says, as we have seen, the water vapor then diffuses out through the stomata and into the air surrounding the leaf. The rate at which this water um, vapor diffuses out of the leaf is generally greater in leaves where there are many open stomata. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure this is self-explanatory, but um, this simply means that the water vapor that is found in the intercellular spaces tends to move out of uh, the leaf through the stomata and through transpiration. So uh, yeah, through sorry, through diffusion, and this is basically how the transpiration pull occurs. And uh, the last point signifies that um, in leaves where there are more amount of somatic present present, meaning that uh, when there are more somatic present, there is like more space through which the water wa water vapors can diffuse through. So obviously the rate will be increased. Uh, should I keep going? Uh huh. Sure. Sure. Yeah. 
Uh, then it says this constant movement of water from the xylem through the mesophyll cells into the air spaces through the stomata into the air means that water is removed from the upper ends of the xylem vessel. Uh, this is self-explanatory, I guess, because um, the concept was that at the top of the plant or at the leaves, the pressure is uh, reduced, meaning that there isn't a lot of pressure. And when the water obviously leaves the, through the stomata, the pressure is obviously decreased. And the pressure at the bottom is obviously high because of diffusion. So water moves upwards. Uh, then this says this reduces the pressure in the vessels. The pressure at the top of the xylem vessel is therefore less than the pressure at the bottom in the roots. This pressure difference causes the water to flow upwards from higher pressure at the bottom to the lower pressure at the top. I already stated this. Uh, then it says the pressure difference is called the transpiration flow because it is caused by the law by the loss of water vapor by transpiration. Uh, this is self-explanatory as well. Um, then it says you can think of transpiration pull as similar to sucking a drink through a straw. As you suck at the top of the straw, um, you reduce the pressure. The pressure at the bottom of the straw is greater than at the top, so the drink flows up the straw and into your mouth. Uh, this is just a concept, I guess. So it's like you suck onto something. If something is like the air, like the air is drawn out of the straw, uh, forcing the liquid to come upwards. The same thing happens in uh, the plant. The water is pulled out um, of the the water vapor is pulled out of the cell. Uh, sorry, the water vapors pulled out of the leaf from the intercellular spaces, which causes a, dif uh, a, di a difference in the what do you call the pressure, and then the water moves upwards because there's obviously empty space. Uh, then it says you can think, yeah, I want to read that. Then it's like the drink and the straw and the water and the xylem can flow upwards like this because water molecules have a strong tendency to stick together. Therefore, is a force of attraction between them. There is a force of, of, of there's a force of attraction between them. As one water molecule moves upwards, others stick, other others stick with it and move up as well. The water therefore stays together as um as one continuous column and does not break apart. Uh, this is something that I didn't know before, but I came to find out in this that um the water molecules have like a strong tendency to stick to one another. So uh, when one of them draws upwards or goes upwards, the other one follows its lead, sticks to it, and hence also draws upwards, and then hence uh. Like, a massive or a long chain is formed of water molecules. Okay, so whatever you were saying right now in the end, I'm actually drawing a diagram to show you. What I'm trying All to right. show you is, is a thin uh, xylem vessel and this is like one water molecule, right? And you can see that there is a force of attraction in between water molecules and a force of attraction in between water molecules and the wall of the xylem. So the reason that, of course, transpiration pull is the greatest suction pressure or the greatest pull that pulls up water against the gravity. But besides that, there are two other forces. One of the forces is cohesion, which means one water molecule is attracted by means of hydrogen bonds to another water molecule. And also that the water molecule is attracted uh, to the wall of the xylem vessel. So both these forces to help together, adhesive force and cohesive force is also Although playing a minimal role, but it's playing a role in contributing to pulling up water against the gravity, right? And uh, I want you to remember the names of these two forces. It's adhesion plus cohesion. And together, they are known as capillary action. Why do we call it capillary action? Because xylem vessels are usually narrow and long. So it's just like uh, causing a fluid to flow through a very, very narrow vessel. So since the vessel is so narrow, the water does not have any other option besides being pulled upwards. Why? Because water molecules are lying very close to each other. So hence there is a force of attraction in between them. And since the wall of the vessel is so thin, there is a force of attraction between the water molecules and the wall of the xylem also. So both these pressures or both these forces add together to create this force, which is the capillary action. All right. Right? So just note down this. I did this. In fact, I want to show you another diagram. Um, Miss, how long have you been teaching for? Uh, I have been teaching for... I'm teaching since 2000 and... Seven. Why are you asking that? 
out of curiosity, 2007. Wow. But actually, uh, yes, 2007. Before that, I was practicing as a pediatrician. As a, oh, so you, did you ever like pursue it as a career or did you? Of course, of course. I've practiced as a pediatrician in public hospitals and private hospitals. Oh, okay. I thought when you said practice, I'm not like you. Uh, practice, uh, you were like... practice means actually, you know, uh, treating children. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And my expertise was treating children who are malnourished. So basically the nutrition oh. part, yes. Until today also, that's my most favorite topic. When it comes to giving advice to my own children, to my family members, I'm very much worried about the diet of a person because I 100% believe that more than 80% of the diseases are because of our, the kind of diet that we are eating. All the problems, everything. So like, are you very subconscious when you eat food or yeah, if you yeah, cook so food? Of course, of course. I, I, you know, at all costs, I try avoiding all outside food, processed food, right? If there is, like, for example, if I'm invited somewhere and there's no choice besides eating that, I sometimes do take a small bit of it, but not like eating in a large amount. I try to eat from my home only and then go to places. And at the same time, like my, the diet which I take at home is I try my best to be as natural and organic as possible. So do your children listen? Yeah, yeah, they, they do. Uh, not all, but like, yes, um, they are also very physically active. So they go to, uh, like they regularly do gym and they do workouts, so they do listen. But of course, uh, since they are young, so they are more exposed to, you know, eating from outside like pizzas and things like that. So they do that as well. But then I'm more conscious. <clears throat> Yeah. But they, they are fond of uh, natural things as well. They, they realize the importance. I always keep doing that, as, at least as far as their, um, or what do I say, their medical care is concerned, whenever they fall ill, right, they know that their mom will treat them in a very, very different manner. As, of course, since I'm a pediatrician, I've never taken them to pediatricians. I treat them myself. <clears throat> and another thing is that I treat them uh, as naturally as possible. Avoiding antibiotics so, and medicines at all costs, unless unless there's a very dire situation in which I have to prescribe something to them. Otherwise, it's all natural therapy. Everything is natural, natural remedy through diet and through soothing agents. That's it. And this is how I've been treating them since so many years. Now they are they are in colleges and universities. My eldest is even doing a job, so they know, and they're very much adapted to it. They know I won't give them lots of medicines at all, even during COVID also, right? Even during yeah. COVID, they had COVID. I did not give any one of them any antibiotic, neither did I take it myself. I was just giving them supportive treatment and it worked well. It has al always worked well for me. It's just, you know, it's just your belief. If you don't believe in something, that thing is never going to affect you, right? Belief is very, very important. You can't just force a person. I've seen so many people who don't believe in these things. Even if I, you know, give them advice, I have seen advice. Yeah, my advice, even if they try, it doesn't work on them because um, they don't believe. They actually think. They actually think that you know, if you go to a doctor, you give him the consultation fees, and you go and buy uh, the, uh, the these medicines, antibiotics, mehengi wali, you know, expensive ones, and then you use them, then only you'll get a cure. Okay, so if you feel happy, be happy about it. I know for sure what side effects they can cause. Right? Yeah. Uh, it's no use. And, and, and first thing is, you know, antibiotics, <clears throat> the use of antibiotics have, it's not use, it's actually abuse. Because I think 80% of the doctors don't, don't even confirm that a person is suffering from a bacterial disease because antibiotics were invented in the first place in this world back then in the 18th century to treat bacterial infections. Nowadays, they are being prescribed indiscriminately for literally everything. Now just imagine COVID-19 is a virus. Why would you like to give an antibiotic in COVID-19? Why? They have no answer. You know, even, even doctors say, this essay, essay thing, I can't take it. If I have knowledge, sorry, I will not put anything in my mouth without having 100% confidence that, okay, this is actually going to benefit me, then only I'll take it. And, it's all the... Uh, Huh. It's really all the money game, to of be course, honest. Like, of course, 100%. Uh, 
I mean, nowadays, I'm not sure about, like, uh, all doctors, but I feel like doctors in general, huh. uh, they can't obviously, like, it's the, the, they can't influence a patient to come to them, right? They actually can in some way. Huh. But, like, it's obviously the patient's choice to whether yes. to come to the doctor or not. Yes. And most of them, uh, they, they're aware of, I feel like due to the access of internet, people are aware of what they're suffering from. Hmm. But just to clarify it or for clarity, they go to a doctor and then the doctor prescribes something to them that hmm. isn't the most appropriate. But I don't know. It's just like a money game that the doctors want. Just instead I, of like caring for the patient, huh. they're, they're more into like the, I don't know, the, the financial business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. And another thing is, I think Google has not solved the problems of people. I'm talking about patients. Google has even worsened their problem. Because if you Google anything, it can tell you two opposite narratives for the same thing. Okay? Now, if you don't have a background medical knowledge, how are you going to decide is this true or is that true? Then in that yeah. case also, in that case also, the doctors can very easily fool the patients. Very, very easily. And uh, that's, that's huh, you bad. have to have, yes, that's bad. I've seen, I've seen so many of my relatives. I, there's one, uh, like one of our family, very close family members. Uh, they are very well off, right? And they always Google things. For instance, they Google things that if you have headache, let's say, you might be having this, 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 this. Okay. Last in the row will be you might be having brain tumor. That's last of all, okay? Not the first top 10 reasons. So they will just pick up that last reason and they'll go to a doctor. It's like inviting yourself to, you know, get, atta get attacked by a doctor, literally inviting. Going to a doctor and saying, Dr. I'm having a headache and I think maybe, you know, maybe it's a brain tumor or whatever. And the, what will the doctor say? He will say, get an MRI done. And then you go and get an MRI. More than 90% of the cases, it will be completely negative. It will not show you anything. So it's, you know, Google has actually even messed up their lives more. And if you have money and you have access to Google and smartphones and you have access to doctors, it's a horrible situation. Horrible. I've seen people having their CT scans and their MRIs for no reason at all, at least on an average 10 times in their lifetime. 10 times is a lot. Every time you get an MRI or a CT scan done, you're exposing your body to gamma rays. These are the same gamma rays which actually, you know, the Poise, same, uh, ah, the, exactly. How can you do that? And I, I can see the difference. Like when I was a doctor, I still remember my, my professors, they used to scold me. Once I had a, I had a posting in neurology ward, right? And he was a neurologist. And at that time, it was back there in 1990s. So he used to say, once, once I said, he said, what will you do to diagnose this case? So I said, okay, I'll do a CT scan. And he gave me a scolding. You know, I still remember for 15 minutes straight, he was constantly shouting at me. He said, what do you think? Do you have extra money? Do you think the patient has itni khamakha ke paise? this and that you say you will sit down you will ask the patient his history you will you'll judge you will look at his sign symptoms you look at his reflexes and I feel that those kind of doctors are obsolete today they are obsolete I don't see such doctors nobody has time everybody is in a hurry fast paced life doctors you know they charge you over here in Pakistani rupees and Pak rupees they on the average they charge you 5000 rupees for consultation they don't even talk to you in Sano ki tara for two minutes. For two minutes. They're just like a machine. They would say, Haan, kya hua? This, this, this is, go and get this test done. On an average, you pay him 5,000. He will advise you a test worth 35 to 50,000 rupees, park rupees. And then isn't, again, that, isn't that what happens in Al Khan? I've heard rumors about it. Of course. Of course. <laughs> of course. Like every time I go to it, like last time I went to it. Huh? Uh, my brother fell ill or something, right? Or my cousin or so mm -hmm. recently. And then they charged like 40 